Uh, it's it's so interesting because when I was planning what we would be doing winter and spring, and I, we sort of put that list together in early January, and you look at this week, and this is an anniversary week for Andrew Johnson, you know, his his birth and everything, and I thought, what an, you know, having no idea that we were going to be talking about impeachment and it was going to coincide with the second um, impeachment in our own recent past and but I thought you know there's something very very interesting about looking at Andrew Johnson looking at someone who is a Tennessee president and of course we've had three we're not Virginia and the Virginians still claim superiority because they are the um, get an appointment Tennessee. but you know we had Andrew Jackson James K Polk and Andrew Johnson and quite frankly you know at least our three presidents didn't go to Washington and just sort of sit around and not create a little bit of controversy at times they were spirited individuals. And Andrew Johnson, I thought, would be an excellent person to take a look at because Johnson is one of those enigmatic kind of individuals. And I think I say that about everybody that we look at, but it's so interesting because I think we, we want so often our historical figures to be that one dimensional. You know, we see George Washington, father of our nation, Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of Independence, you know, Andrew Jackson, Cherokee removal, and we sort of want to do a one-dimensional when in reality, they are all such complex individuals. And Andrew Johnson, in many ways, is as complex or maybe more complex than the majority of our American presidents. And, and he's just such an interesting person. I have shared a few slides with Anne, and, and I'm sort of going to put those slides up. We're going to, I'm going to use them because I want us to kind of look at who Johnson was and then maybe have a picture of him as we talk about him a little bit. And then we're gonna actually look at one of the 19. They started out with nine, then they went to 10, then they went to 19, and then they actually really only sort of pushed through about nine of them, the actual impeachment. We're gonna look at the articles of impeachment or look at the main one and sort of kind of figure out why indeed Johnson is such a, an, such a, a difficult character. And, and I have to tell you that if you think about Andrew Johnson and you think about him as president, and that's when he comes on most people's consciousness. You know, there is the tragedy of the American Civil War, Abraham Lincoln is assassinated, Andrew Johnson is propelled into the presidency, and then of course is never elected as president in his own right. And that has happened, you know, several times in history, but his is probably the most contentious of those never elected on his own. You know, Lyndon Johnson, we talked about two weeks ago, and, and of course, Johnson is propelled into the presidency with the Kennedy assassination, but then shortly thereafter wins a four-year term of his own and could have stood for election for an additional four-year term, but knew that it just really was not in the political cards because of the quagmire of Vietnam and civil rights and and all the things that were happening in the 60s that those of us who are <clears throat> older remember. Um, but if you think about Andrew Johnson and the impeachment, the, the etching that you see on your screen right now, which shows Johnson up in, in the box as they are examining his, his appropriate actions as president, and you see Congress seated before him, the Senate, of course, serving his trial, uh, the impeachment process, you'll remember, always requires House of Representatives draw up the articles of impeachment, and if they pass, then the president is impeached, and then the trial occurs in, <clears throat> in the Senate, and historically, the, the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court sits as the presiding judge over that trial, and then if there is a verdict to remove from office, then that person is removed from office. I, I think in the general public, maybe up until recently when we've had some experience with impeachment, the word impeachment tended to imply removal from office. And of course, that's not it. It is the bringing up on charges. So, and I'm gonna let you flip to the next slide so that we all have a real good picture of, of Andrew Johnson. I mean, doesn't he look like a really cheerful person? Notice, that was tongue in cheek, but you know, obviously photography during that point in history, you couldn't have very big smiles because you had to hold them for quite a while because the camera was pretty still, but he's a pretty solemn looking guy. You'll notice that I've given you the dates. He comes into office on April the 15th of 1865, and he will serve until the new president, Ulysses S. Grant, is sworn into office on the 4th of March. 
1869, remembering that we were still had a March inauguration at that point in our history. And he will be born in 1808. In fact, he is the first president that is born in the 19th century and he will live until 1875. But let's talk a little bit about Johnson prior to coming into the presidency. And I think it might set up for you a bit of an understanding as to why he ends up being an easy target. Um, perhaps the, the uh, webmaster of his own weave that he gets caught in. So, you know, he's gonna clash repeatedly while he is president with the radical Republicans in Congress. And most of the clash is gonna be over how is the South gonna be treated during reconstruction. And of course that will culminate in February of 1868 with articles of impeachment and then the trial that will begin in March of 1868. And of course to remove a president from office requires a two thirds majority of those who are voting. And we're, you know, as you saw in the promo, Johnson will fall one vote, one vote short of being removed from office. So let's talk a little bit about who this guy is and then maybe get a sense for why he is unwilling to comply with what he thinks are the, the inappropriate demands of Congress and why they of course see him as being stubborn and pig headed. Um, he's born in 1808 in North Carolina and he's born into as he would later say, poverty, uh, no formal schooling. And quite frankly, that wasn't as uncommon then as it would be today because so many people learned, they were educated within their families. They were, you know, they learned to read because mom taught them how to read or whatever. He is not um, illiterate, but he is not well educated. He does uh, begin to train as a tailor, he moves to a new little town in Tennessee, Johnson City, and he will move to that area and he will begin to court a shoemaker's daughter by the name of Eliza McCarty. And, and he will eventually marry her. She is a school teacher and she will begin to help him self-educate at home. Now, interestingly, Every biography you read of Johnson, it talks about he marries into Eliza's family and it elevates him significantly socially. Her father was a successful shoemaker, you know, a tradesman, and they were very active in community affairs. So everyone thought she had married down as a school teacher because she married this sort of itinerant tailor who was finding a new place to call home. And yet she becomes his most ardent supporter. Um, we know from her notes more than from Johnson's early on is that he had an innate talent for debate and oratory. He loved to argue. Now that, that should be a warning for us as to what's gonna happen. It is because of Eliza that he will eventually offer himself for, as a candidate for alderman, city council basically in, in the Greenville area. Uh, outside in what will eventually become the Johnson City area. So he's elected in 1829. So he's 21 years old, he becomes an alderman. And then he does that job so well that five years later, he is elected as mayor and he will serve as the, the mayor for two terms. Then he gets elected to the Tennessee General Assembly and he will stay active in state politics for a number of years and What's interesting is you go back and you sort of read the newspapers and I have I've just been burning up my newspapers.com subscription looking at old newspapers because Johnson is always referred to as this fiery orator and champion of the working class people and a challenger to the aristocratic plantation owners of the notorious antebellum south so you know he's sort of a you know, you almost liken him to Jackson in the same sort of way who identifies with the common man. So Johnson is doing the same sort of thing. Um, he identifies with the working class poor and he angers enough people in state politics because of the, the dispersions he casts on the well-educated and the landed gentry as he refers to them that in, um, in 1843, 1853, 
they redraw based on the 1850 census, they redraw the congressional districts in Tennessee and they gerrymander him out of his district, thinking that he will just go away. And that part of his background probably should have been a hint to what might occur in the future because Johnson, instead of going, oh, well, you know, they've gerrymandered me out of my district. You know, it's kind of reminiscent of when Andrew Jackson takes on Davy Crockett and, and Jackson runs an opponent against Davy Crockett and Davy Crockett loses his congressional seat and then he makes that wonderful fiery speech. Am I allowed to say this and mute me if I'm not? But I always love when Davy Crockett gets up and, and basically lamb blast Andrew Jackson, who Crockett sees Jackson as having become part of that landed gentry and Crockett more of the frontiersman. And he basically lamb blasts Jackson for having stolen the election from him and then say, announces to the members of Congress that they can all go to hell because he's going to Texas. And, and we know what ends up happening with, with Crockett. Well, Johnson, when they gerrymander him out of his office, he turns around and runs for governor. And because he has so identified with the working class and the poor who outnumber the landed gentry, he is elected governor of Tennessee and then reelected as governor of Tennessee. And you know that there are members of, of the, the dominant parties in Tennessee that are looking at each other going, well, that didn't, that didn't work out the way I had it planned. We, we, you know, we sort of thought he would just go away and instead, doggone it, here he is. And he garners enough support that in 1857, he's gonna be in, end up being elected to the US Senate. Now, that's important for our story to kind of set us up for what's gonna to lead to the impeachment. So Johnson's always an independent thinker. He is a union Democrat, but you will remember that by 1860, there were so many factions. In fact, one of the reasons that Abraham Lincoln is elected in the 1860 election is that Lincoln is the Republican candidate but there is a Democratic candidate, there is a constitutional Democratic candidate, and there is a union Democratic candidate, which of course splits the Democratic party, allowing Lincoln to be elected. Well, Johnson's a, a really independent sort of person. So when Lincoln is elected, you know, he's elected in November of 1860, and by December, the seven deep Southern states will meet in South Carolina, just sort of a side plug, always South Carolina. South Carolina is always, you know, when you're looking at pre-Civil War history, Civil War history, post-Civil War history, it's always South Carolina that is right smack dab in the midst of all of the controversy. So they meet in South Carolina and Johnson addresses the representatives of those states, you know, the seven deep Southern states, but Tennessee is present there. And Johnson addresses the delegates and he proclaims to the delegates that are there that he is loyal to the union. He is a union man. He believes in the founding principles and you know you may disagree with political policies uh, of the US government, but he does not believe that secession is an allowable action. We, once you have joined the union, you cannot just as Madison and Jefferson sort of alluded in the Kentucky and Virginia resolves, you can't just choose to nullify and withdraw from a union. You know, Johnson doesn't believe that. So Tennessee will succeed, but Johnson never gives up his seat in Washington as a US Senator. And that was unique. He's the only one of the Southern senators that does not come home while Tennessee withdraws from the union. Of course, Tennessee was so terribly divided on the issues of secession and slavery, but you know, obviously the dominant uh, vote was for secession. Um, he is, because he is so loyal in 1862, President Lincoln designates him to be the military governor over Tennessee. Um, and Tennessee, you know, by 1862 and through 1863, chunk by chunk by chunk, will come under the authority of the, of the Union through the military uh, control of the state. You know, those of us that are here in Chattanooga know that, you know, by the end of that year, 
U.S. Grant's going to be here in Chattanooga. He's going to have his headquarters over close to Tennessee River. At one point, he's going to be in a tent on top of the hill where today the flagpole stands at the Chattanooga National Cemetery, and in Chattanooga will become the gateway to the south. So Tennessee is divided, and, and all of that is occurring under the leadership of Andrew Johnson as the military governor. Now, 1864, Abraham Lincoln is having to deal with a um, to deal with a challenge from George Meade, who had been one of his generals during the early days of the Civil War, and and President Lincoln had removed him from office because George Meade's reputation was hurry up and wait. You know, he would push and then get right to the point that perhaps he could have scored a victory and then he would falter. He he was not particularly bold, and Meade, when he is removed from office, will then begin to rally his political forces, those loyal to him, and he will mount a challenge to Abraham Lincoln in 1864. Lincoln, in an attempt to, to show, you know, his, the, his belief that the South truly has not seceded, and, and, you know, that's a philosophical, obviously, we're in the middle of the war, fighting is going on, but Lincoln will always say that the South has really not seceded. They are in rebellion, yes, but they have not truly left the Union. So he nominates, he chooses Andrew Johnson as his running mate in that election that will occur in the fall of 1864 with the coming into office in March of 1865. Now, you know, Johnson is a pretty controversial figure, but as he comes into office, we have every indication going back and looking at the records of speeches on the floor of, of the House and the Senate, looking at newspaper articles, there was a period of optimism. In fact, Ben Wade, who is one of the radical Republicans out of Ohio, when Johnson comes into the presidency, now think about the fact that, you know, he, they are installed into office. They are inaugurated on March the 4th, and six weeks later, Abraham Lincoln is dead. So Johnson has not even really discovered the best route to his office, much less has begun to understand the duties of the vice presidency or to begin to observe and be even more familiar with the day-to-day -day routines of being president. Suddenly he's thrust into that office. Ben Wade, and I, and I want to read you with this, when Ben Wade realizes Johnson is become, going to become president, <laughs> my dog is growling at a balloon. Um, he says, by the gods, there will be no trouble now in running this government. That's Wade's assessment for what's going to come on. But pretty quickly, things are going to sour. Um, Cicero, stop. Sorry. I have a balloon and he does not like the balloon apparently. Um, things are gonna sour pretty quickly because Lincoln, as he had written and talked about reconstruction, had wanted an easy reconstruction. He had wanted what he called a 10% plan. Everybody remember that from your American history? Maybe. I think we must have, I think we may have run through that in Mrs. Savage's. American history class in 19 and <laughs> at, at Upperman Seminary when I was a high school junior. But, you know, Lincoln's plan was he, because he didn't believe the South had ever really truly succeeded, he was not going to make returning to the Union very difficult. It was going to be a 10% plan. Once 10% of the citizens of the state had pledged their loyalty to the Union, the state would be readmitted and all rights and privileges would be restored. And he had not come out clearly that he would even deny rights to vote to those who had served in the Confederate government or even in the Confederate army. You know, he dies, Johnson comes into power, the radical Republicans, certainly that's not a plan that they want. They want the South to be punished. I mean, the Union, the nation's gone through a war that's lasted across five Aprils and they want the South to be punished for having dragged us through this war that, you know, up until today in a single war claimed more lives than the wars of the 20th century all together. So, you know, it was a cataclysmic moment in our nation with that American Civil War. Now, they're going to 
push through or begin to push through a series of pieces of legislation that have to do with former slaves that have to do, um, they want they want Confederate leaders and those who have served in military uh, positions of leadership to be denied citizenship. They should not be allowed to vote and everything. Johnson's opposed to that. Johnson says, you know, they lost the war. They are now coming back into the union. We are going to bring them back in as prodigal sons. You know, that's a lovely idea. Um, the radical Republicans are not gonna buy that. The other thing is, the uh, radical Republicans are really looking at a plan as to how do you bring former slaves into freedom, active citizenship, um, being becoming part of the political process. And of course, one of the first things they do is they organize a civil rights bill and a Freedmen's Bureau bill, both of which are going to hit Congress in 1866, and Andrew Johnson's going to veto them. And in the very first time that this ever happens in American history, Congress will override his veto. Isn't that fascinating? I mean, we come into power, we have a constitution by 1789, Andrew Johnson is the 17th president in the United States and he's the first president to have a veto overridden by Congress. Two thirds of both houses override him on the issue of the Freedmen's Bureau and the Civil Rights Act of 1866. While he's a good unionist, he is not necessarily a proponent of full equality and especially not at this juncture in, in time. So when they override his veto, he, he's pretty angry about it. He speaks out against what he believes that they are, are um, bringing former slaves into citizenship, giving them too much power too quickly there should be an educational process and everything. And they, because they are angry with him, will begin to draft what will become the 14th and 15th Amendments to the US Constitution. 13th Amendment, of course, abolishes slavery. 14th Amendment gives the rights of citizenship and includes in it a section where states also, along with the federal government, cannot deny rights of citizenship without due process of law. 14th Amendment is probably one of the most significant amendments we have to our US Constitution. 15th Amendment then is the right to vote. Um, and then in March of 1867, trying to get my timeline correct in my mind, in March of 1867, they pass again a second time over Johnson's presidential veto, a piece of legislation called the Tenure of Office Act. And therein will come the final rub that's gonna bring us to an impeachment uh, situation. Now, historically, presidents always chose their cabinets. They might have a formal cabinet and they, those would be appointments that were approved by an act of the Senate. Um, Historically, the Senate, in fact, it's not until we get to this point in time that the Senate ever said no to anyone that a president wanted to nominate, whether it was for a cabinet position or for a member of the Supreme Court. Normally, senatorial courtesy, if the person that candidate, you know, the state that that candidate was from, if the two senators from that state approved it, everybody else did, it was not the contentious sort of thing that we have seen in the last probably 30 years or so. Um, it was pretty much cut and dry that that person would be appointed. And then if the president decided they didn't want that person to be in office, then they simply either summarily dismissed that person, basically said, you can resign and save face or I will fire you and you can go home. You know, what do you wanna do? And nine times out of 10 people would say, you know, for personal reasons, I have chosen that I will no longer be the secretary of whatever and they would go home. Well, the Tenure of Office Act basically said that the president could not terminate anyone who was a member of his cabinet without approval from the Senate. So that will take us to what's about to happen. And Anne, I'm gonna let you move to the next slide, which I think is, okay. Yeah, so Henry Stanton is Secretary of War and Henry Stanton has been appointed Secretary of War by Abraham Lincoln. Uh, if you have not read Doris Kearns Goodwin's book about Abraham Lincoln, and it's called Team of Rivals. It's a fascinating book. I'm sure the library probably has it. But in it, she talks about the fact that John, the, 
you know, Abraham Lincoln knew that that he was a president elected by a less than 50 percent majority of the votes. And then he had a lot of enemies, people who did not care for him, were not uh, particularly enamored with the newly created Republican Party, with the idea of abolition, all those sorts of things. So he pretty much chose everyone who was a political enemy and made, gave them a cabinet position because he said he could watch them more closely with them in his cabinet than he could um, if they were off doing their own thing. So Andrew Johnson, when he becomes president, inherits Secretary of War Stanton as his Secretary of War. Well, they don't care for each other. They have never cared for each other. They disagree about, they disagreed about the war during the time when Johnson was in Congress and they are now sort of at odds with each other. And Johnson decides that he is going to dismiss him from office. And you see before you on the screen, this lovely little note that is sent to uh, Secretary of War Stanton and notice it says by virtue of the power and authority vested in me just so you know that I have the right to do this is what Johnson's saying knowing that the Tenure of Office Act has already been passed and he disagrees that Congress has the right to approve who would sit on his cabinet or whom he could remove he said he makes it very clear as president by the Constitution and the laws of the United States you are hereby removed from the office of the Secretary for the Department of War and you're going to transfer your power over to Major General Thomas, Adjutant General of the Army, and he will now become Secretary of War. Respectfully, yours, Andrew Johnson, and he has it hand delivered to Stanton. Well, um, it doesn't go the way that he's planned. His enemies in Congress immediately began, they've been looking talking about impeachment really ever since the Civil Rights Act of 1866, but now they think they really have him. So now they are going to begin to seriously talk about impeachment. Um, and at that point, you know, Stanton, Stanton really has opposed Johnson's reconstruction plans. Johnson had originally thought that he would replace Stanton with Ulysses S. Grant, and in fact, in 1867, when Congress was in recess, Johnson had suspended Stanton and had announced that he was putting Grant into that position. Then when Senate came, the Senate came back into session in the fall and they were angry with him, Grant had said, no, 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 no I, I thank you so much. That's lovely to be considered, but no, thank you. I don't think I want that position. I'm, I'm, I'm going to step down from it. Grant has presidential ambitions of his own. And that's when Johnson will proceed to nominate or to put into that position Major General Thomas. Um, and that's General Lorenzo Thomas who had served in the Union Army during the Civil War. Well, when that happens, immediately we're gonna go to a challenge of can Johnson fire somebody on his own cabinet level? So, and let's go to the next slide. Um, and you will see, you know, they're going to come up with a series of articles in which they're going to, the members of Congress coming out of the House, but remember that this will be a joint action that will occur between the leadership of the House and the Senate together. And so they're going to come up with a list of everything that they think he has done wrong. So, you know, they're going to come up first with 11 articles of impeachment. Most all of them have to do with something related to the tenure of Office Act. Uh, the first one says Johnson has removed Stanton knowing that he was doing something wrong. Articles two, three, and eight, I believe it is, say that he has conspired with Thomas to replace Stanton, which then makes it a high crime and not just a misdemeanor. And they go through this whole thing of of all the different ways in which the con in which the president has created a situation in which he has acted with high crimes and misdemeanors. And the reason that they come up with so many different resolutions, so many different articles of impeachment is quite frankly, they can't get an agreement from a constitutional scholar as to what does high crimes and misdemeanors mean. Interestingly, that's still a debate today. You know, the founding fathers were so vague in drafting that clause within Article II of the Constitution about the removal of the presidency from office that 
you know, their idea was, and if we go back and read Madison's notes, is that they didn't know how to define it, but if they saw it, they would know it. <laughs> and of course, this is the first time we're going to have a full-blown impeachment of a, a sitting U.S. president. So they eventually will come together with a series of articles, most of them around the Tenure of Office Act. Um, one will be that Johnson has incited the public to riot and to rebel against the members of Congress, challenging you know, the authority of Congress as an equal partner in the government of the United States, which I find fascinating. Um, all of the articles together, you're gonna find Thaddeus Stevens. And by this, uh, you know, this time, Thaddeus Stevens is an old man. He, you know, most of us remember Stevens from the knockdown drag out fight between Stevens and Brooks where they're beating each other with their canes in Congress in the 1850s. Well, you know, this is, you know, the late 1860s and Stevens is an old man who is carrying still some of those wounds, but he believes his bottom line, he announces in a speech to Congress is that Johnson has violated his presidential oath in which he pledges to execute the duties and the responsibilities of the office and then pledges that upon the Constitution of the United States. So take a look at Article 1. And, and I chose Article 1, and this is just a part of it. Article 1 is actually a couple of pages long, but I tried to highlight for you in red what it is that they're really angry at Andrew Johnson. And, and I, would, I would postulate that they are angry at Andrew Johnson for a multitude of things. And the Tenure of Office Act is that one thing that they can sort of hang him on. Um, I think we know that in our own personal lives, you know, there are times when you've just been pushing, you've been pushing, you've been pushing, it's finally there's that one thing that that breaks your your wall of composure and everything and, and it just unleashes a torrent of storms and, and winds and screams and hollers or whatever. And this is Congress screaming and hollering at a sitting president. Notice it says um, basically that Andrew Johnson, unmindful of the high duties of his oath of office and the requirements of the constitution. Okay, let's get down to the bottom lines. He has violated his oath of office and you know he took his oath of office with his hand on a Bible. That's a really serious thing. And the requirements of the constitution, the supreme law of the land of this nation. You know, he pledged he would execute the laws of this land and he has not done so. And notice the, the second section that I have in red says, did unlawfully in violation issue an order in writing. You know, this is, we're not alleging that he did this. We've got the written evidence that he did this. He removed Edwin M. Stanton from the office of secretary of the war department. And, you know, and they go on in the articles to say he was duly appointed and approved by the Senate and therefore, you know, this is a violation of constitutional law. Um, Johnson's arguments, Johnson's, Johnson's, when, it's interesting, when Johnson begins to mount a, um, a defense, the other thing too, and, and Ann, I'll let you show the next slide and then we'll talk just a little bit about the actual impeachment process. You know, they say, you know, this president is volatile. He's out there making speeches, stumping, and he's calling for rebellions and riots and, and questioning the legitimate authority. This is just an excerpt from one of the speeches that Johnson had delivered. And if you look at it, I mean, it's pretty fiery. I mean, it almost sounds like, and I can say this, having grown up in the South and grown up in the Baptist church, this almost has that sort of rhetoric that you would see from a fiery church pulpit orator where he says, you know, it's very easy to indulge in epithets. It is easy to call a man a Judas and, and, and call him to be a traitor. But notice he says, if I played Judas, Judas, who has been the Christ that I played Judas with? Is Thaddeus Stevens Christ? Is it Wendell Phillips? Charles Sumner, really, really, Sumner and Brooks, you know, these are the men that stop and compare themselves with the Savior, and everybody that differs with them is therefore a Judas. I mean, that, that's pretty fiery rhetoric when you think about the 1860s and, and Johnson 
saying this and notice he says, but let me say to you, if you stand by me, what am I going to do? God be willing, I'm going to kick them out. I'll kick them out as fast as I can. He's going to try and campaign against them to make sure that they are all removed from office in the next election, knowing that in 1868, there will be an election in the House and that one third of the senators will be up for reelection. And, you know, he's ready to take them all on. So has he incited the people to riot? Uh, that might be stretching it a little. Is he really thoroughly disgusted with the members of Congress? Of course he is. He's angry at them, they're angry at him, and they're all just hissing and spitting like a room full of angry cats or something. Now, what's interesting is when the president receives word that the articles of impeachment have passed in the House of Representatives and the timetable is such, you know, they only have three weeks or so until the actual trial will occur, he has to put together a defense team. And the attorney general at that time, who's a guy by the name of Henry Stanberry, resigns as attorney general so that he can chair the president's defense. And his argument, he's going to be joined by uh, Benjamin Curtis. And Benjamin Curtis had, had just left the U.S. Supreme Court. He had been a dissenting vote in the Dred Scott decision. And so he's a, a pretty well-known um, judicial figure. And, you know, they put together a, pretty, a really pretty good team. Thomas Nelson, who was a judge from Tennessee, will be on that team. But anyway, they put together a team. And their defense is... And I think this is fascinating. Their defense is Johnson didn't choose this cabinet. Johnson inherited this cabinet from Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln had put the cabinet in place. They had been his cabinet. He died. Johnson becomes president. They became Johnson's cabinet. But Johnson had never gone to Congress, had never gone to the Senate and said, these are the people I want to to be. And there was a historical precedent that when a new president comes in, the old cabinet knows that they're out. They pack their bags up and we have that peaceful transfer of power that makes the Republic so wonderful. So they're gonna argue that he couldn't be impeached for removing someone from a position that he really shouldn't have been sitting in that position because Johnson had not nominated him to be there. Um, the Senate is going, you know, the House actually, and then the Senate will hear the argument, the Senate or the House and their, their um, legal argument will say Johnson should have, if Johnson didn't want him, then Johnson should have come back to the Senate and should have asked for all new people in that position. And then, of course, what you're going to find is that Stanberry is his chief legal person is going to say, well, you know, we've never had this situation before. You know, we've never had the Tenure of Office Act. We've never had a president who may have not wanted to inherit a cabinet that his predecessor had put together. So at best, the president is guilty of misconstruing a very difficult concept of constitutional law. And you know, the president is not a constitutional lawyer. He's not a lawyer, period. So you can't hold him responsible for misinterpreting something that constitutional scholars themselves are arguing about. You know, and, and it, it comes into a, a great big long case that will be heard in the Senate. And, you know, you've got um, debate going on. There are 25 prosecution witnesses. There's 16 defense witnesses. It becomes a public spectacle. And if you'll go to the next slide, I, I, it's just fascinating. So they allow 1,000 tickets for each day of the impeachment. And it's fascinating. And, and I want to make sure I get my numbers right. Let me find my note wherever. OK, so um, the diplomatic corps gets 40 tickets. 20 goes to go to the president. Each member of the Senate gets four tickets. The chief justice gets four tickets. And each member of the House gets two tickets. And they can invite anyone they want in to watch the impeachment. It becomes the event of the social season. 
and each day the ticket is a different color they they rotate so that you can't come one day hang on to your ticket and think you might be able to sneak in the next day and and if you go online sometime and look you know they're red they're orange they're purple they're blue they're light blue they're yellow they're green you know they want to make certain that there is no question but what you're allowed to be there that day so one of the members of Congress said, you know, I get two tickets and I have over 400 requests each day from constituents who want to be here because it's the first time in history that you've impeached a president and they want to be a part of the historical process. So, you know, it was sensational in every detail. You can go back and look at the newspapers. I mean, it was dramatic. Um, the members of Congress, as they begin to mount the trial, realize that there's some duplication in the articles of impeachment. So they're really gonna focus on three of the articles that have to do with the Tenure of Office Act and the one article that has to do with inflammatory speech. And when it comes down to it, after all the trial, after all the, the witnesses and everything, it comes down to on May the 16th of 1868, a very dramatic roll call vote in which the members of the Senate will stand up and cast their votes aloud. 35 senators vote to convict Andrew Johnson of high crimes and misdemeanors. 19 senators vote against the impeachment articles and Andrew Johnson survives the presidency by one vote. But of course, what it really means is that for the remainder of his presidency, it is going to be a uh, sort of a stalemate. The president's going to look at Congress. Congress is going to look at the president. And Johnson decides he has no stomach for it. So, you know, he will choose to not run for re-election. The truth of the matter is, had he opted to run for re-election, I'm certain the party probably would not have given him the nomination because he was not a Republican sitting. He was a constitutional or a union Democrat sitting in a Republican slot. So he was not going to get that slot in the Democratic Party was not going to, to run him. So what he's going to do is he will serve out his term. And he leaves the office on March the 4th of 1869. He comes back to Tennessee. He becomes locally involved again. And he will decide that there is a place for him in politics, that he has an experience. He does see himself as a voice for the common people. And in 1874, he will run for a U.S. Senate seat from the state of Tennessee and Tennesseans will elect him to go back to the Senate. He will serve just three months and he will have come home for recess. He will be on his way back to Washington when he will, we think, they were never certain whether it was a heart attack or a, or a cerebral hemorrhage, but he will die on the train ride back to Washington, back to his seat. So he serves only three months of that final um, seat in the Senate. And for the first time in our nation's history, we have impeached a president who has survived that challenge by one vote, but who will forever be remembered as having been impeached. Um, you know, and, and Johnson remains that person, did he, did he know that in removing Stanton from office that he might very well be impeached? We really don't know. Johnson didn't leave any notes saying that, but Johnson believed until the day he died, and we know from his notes in the 1870s, he believed he had every right to choose who should be his closest advisors as president, and that he had the right to remove Stanton. And he believed that the radical Republicans enacted the Tenure of, of Office Act purposely to challenge his authority as president. And then when he met that challenge by removing Stanton, that they had set him up. And, and he was forever bitter about the situation, but believed that the vote proved him to be victorious. Um, it's a fascinating chapter in history, and, and I know we're already at 550, and here I have talked way too much, and I'm going to let you take the slides down and let me see everybody's face, because I know that, that we have places to go and things to do, 
but I would love to hear some of your comments. You know, Steve, I did notice this morning, I saw your comment about the fact that Andrew Johnson's mother was a McDonough. So I'm, I, unmute yourself. Is, is, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> is he part of your family? We think so, yeah. In the family <laughs> histories that we've done some research on, uh, we go back to, to her and to him and uh so you've got my sister debbie on here and of course elizabeth and my son john yay uh, so well Jennifer, where's Jennifer. john i don't see john uh, okay. elizabeth's trying to find john yes <laughs> he was uh, he was muted in un and stopped video though i think i guess that's my john but uh, <laughs> well but, uh, that's not a relative we've always claimed. <laughs> but you know what? I think <laughs> you know, I, I used to tell folks when I thought about Johnson, you know, Johnson is fiery. Johnson is hard headed. He is stubborn. <laughs> I don't agree with a number of his um, ideas. You know, you if mm -hmm. you go back and you think 1860s, you know, immediate citizenship, citizenship, but maybe an educational process. I mean, all of it was such an uncertain period of time. And, you know, I, I don't uh, agree always with his attitude mm -hmm. in those areas. But, you know, I'm not so certain that he's not right about the Tenure of Office Act. I really do believe that it was purposely put in place to get him. And, yeah. and he was stubborn enough that if they wanted to play hardball, he was going to play with them. So I think I'd claim him as kinship. Okay. Yeah. I, I think I'd, I might go around and go, don't mess with me. I'm kidding. That. Awesome. So, sounds good. Other folks, tell me, tell me what your impressions, because you know, I think yeah. everybody knows Andrew Jackson so much and Johnson and Pope get lost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When LBJ became president, um, when LBJ became president, he had to do the same thing. I know you mentioned it just briefly. So he wasn't able to appoint his cabinet until he was reelected. Is that right? Until he was reelected. And, and of course, that was a serious point of contention because, you know, while John Kennedy and LBJ saw each other as politically expedient, LBJ and Robert Kennedy despised each other absolutely despised each other and you know there's that classic scene at jo at john kennedy's funeral when robert kennedy is giving his uh, giving his speech in which he quotes from julius caesar and i mean i think it's so profound where he talks about john kennedy and uses the line from caesar about we will cut him out and place him among the stars and no one will give homage to the garish son and when Kennedy delivers that line, he looks at Lyndon Johnson. And Johnson, from that point on, despises King. Of course, they didn't like each other anyway. But from that point on, they despise each other. But Johnson, Johnson was political enough to know that he had a greater chance of getting everything he wanted done if he waved the bloody shirt, if he used Kennedy's assassination. And he did it so masterfully. There are a number of instances in Congress when it looked like he wasn't gonna be able to get a piece of legislation passed because remember this, the Southern Democrats were still a power to be contended with in 64, 65 and 66. And Johnson would say, well, you know, I, re I, w I really was hoping that I could get this piece of legislation passed because it was something that the late president really hoped <laughs> that we would do. And then, of course, everybody in unison would go and sniff and everything, and they'd vote yes, and Johnson would go, yes. You know, Andrew Johnson, bless his heart, was not politic at all. I mean, there are other ways he could have dealt with the Tenure of Office Act, but he just was such a letter of the law person that he, he just, you know, if they challenged him, he was going to meet them head on. You know, I... It's just fascinating. It's fascinating when you look at it. Ah, Ann just posted that, yes, the library does have Doris Kearns Goodwin's Team of Rivals in the stack. It's a fabulous book. There are some really good books out there about Johnson. There are some great books actually out there about you know the Lincoln assassination, more books on President Lincoln than any other president in US history as far as books that have been written. 
And there are some good books out there, even on the radical Republicans and Thaddeus Stevens and Sumner and Brooks and Wade and, and some of those guys and, and why mm -hmm. they felt like they needed to work so fast while they had the impetus also of Lincoln's assassination to be able to change the role for, for former slaves, for African-American citizens. And of course, that lasts until the Compromise of 1877 and Reconstruction is declared to be over and the world is all happy and good and we are plunged into Jim Crow for the next century. So. Um, do you think do you think the authors of our constitution had purpose in leaving the definition of high crimes and misdemeanors so undefined and so open for interpretation and as a second part to that has there ever been an attempt since Johnson to try to tighten it up and they you know there have been talk there has been talk of having constitutional conventions about every 20 years or something somebody will say oh we need a constitutional convention and that's one of the aspects of the constitution that is so vague um and i you know did the founding fathers do it on purpose i know madison in his notes when he talks about we don't know what it really means but we'll know it when we see it you know it's kind of like and we use that as an example so often in life. It's kind of like, I don't know what I want, but when I find it, I'll know what I want. But oh my gosh, you know, I guess that's putting a tremendous amount of trust in the members of Congress to know what is frivolous versus what is a, theory, a serious abuse of power, either as a misdemeanor or a high crime. And the, the misdemeanor thing is what buffaloes me sometimes, I mean, so, you know, what would be a misdemeanor that would get the president removed from office? So you find him standing in the corner of a cloakroom smoking a joint or something? I mean, I think probably no one, I'm not sure that would be controversial, but that probably wouldn't. Twitter, Twitter. <laughs> oh my Lord, you know. <laughs> I am sure the founding fathers, you know, if they're all somewhere as sanct sanctioned beings that are looking down there are going, oh, I'm so glad they didn't have Twitter, or Instagram, <laughs> any of that stuff when I was president. I mean, think about it. And, and maybe this is a good point for us to wrap up. I think about, you know, Franklin Roosevelt as president for, you know, from 1932 until he dies in 1945. And he's in a wheelchair. He is walking with braces and crutches because of the polio and everything. And the press never tells that story. They carefully only photograph him looking hale and hearty. And it's not until after he dies that the American public realizes, I mean, the press today, within 15 seconds of seeing him, it would be blasted everywhere. It's kind of interesting how we have changed from you know safeguarding the president helping him maintain his position as you know maybe the the individual supreme commander in the united states of the military and civilian and all of that to and and quite truthfully the majority of our presidents even when they have been like johnson fiery and stubborn and oratorical in their nature have known what to say and what not to say. And that uh, isn't always the case. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, we, we have to hope, we have to hope that, that people who aspire to the office of presidency also aspire to what I think is the appropriate decorum of being president. You know, there's something about and I've always said, you know, if I were ever elected as president, I think I could behave for four to eight years and then go off and be crazy somewhere. But for that four to eight years, I think I could behave and, and put the nation first. But, you know, Johnson, I think, thought he was in challenging Congress's attempt, he thought, to, to have more power than they should have. He felt justified in fighting them. That seems so mild today compared to some of the things that we've seen in the last 50 years. Um, 
with the expansive powers of the presidency now that I think the founding fathers never envisioned the president would be as much of a focal point or as powerful as he is today. That began with Teddy Roosevelt, but it has certainly escalated in the last 50 or 60 years. Yeah, I'm sure James Madison truly is somewhere going. Told them we should have added that extra clause in there or something, and they just wouldn't listen to me with all of his books on Montesquieu and everything.